Lindbergh kidnapping winter olympics in new york pope pius meets mussolini the year is 1932 studebaker launches a short-lived line called rockney but before getting into all of it i'm jay welcome to what it's like the automotive channel that talks about all of the cool cars you've never knew existed if you dig weird quirky cars that you never knew existed this is the channel for you we cover the classics vintage some exotics we love the orphan cars and cars that never Never seem to get the time of day and are frankly being forgotten. Dive in deep with specs and show what these cars are like. If that sounds of interest to you, a channel that you will totally dig, subscribe and hit the bell icon next to it to never miss a video. Rockney was a subsidiary of Studebaker and it was only offered for two years, 1931 to 1933 for the 32 and 33 model year. Named after famed University of Notre Dame football coach Newt Rockney, the man, not the car, led Notre Dame for 13 seasons with over 100 wins and three national championships, regarded as one of the greatest coaches of college football in history. The man, the myth, the legend, Newt Rockney, was allegedly going to retire from football, was offered a position by Albert Erskine, who was president of Studebaker. He offered Rockney a position as sales promotional manager of Rockney Car. The two go way back, and they were really close friends. Unfortunately, Newt Rockney never saw any of this come to fruition because he, unfortunately, he died in a plane crash on March 31st of 1931. The car was designed by Roy Cole and Ralph Vale, who operated a consulting firm called Vale Cole Engineering. And the funny thing is, this car was never intended to be a Studebaker product. This car was originally pitched to Willis Overland to replace the Whippet line, but after finding out that W.O. or Willis Overland wasn't really good financially, Vale drove over to Studebaker to see if they would be interested in this design. Studebaker wasn't in any better shape financially than W.O., but they loved the design, and they needed a lower-priced offering to replace the short-lived Eskine line that was discontinued in 1930. 1932, there were two Rockney models, the 65, which was based on a 110-inch wheelbase, billed as the world's cheapest price 6, and the 75, which rode a longer 114-inch wheelbase. The 65 could be had as a two-door sedan, two-passenger coupe, Four-passenger coupe, a.k.a. rumble seat coupe, four-passenger roadster, four-door sedan, was offered as standard or deluxe. The standard had one spare tire at the rear. The deluxe had the dual side mounts mounted at the front. Let's talk specs. It rides a wheelbase of 110 inches. It weighs 3,085 pounds. Price, if you got the regular Base standard model, $635, which is equivalent to you spending $14,096.40 in the year 2023. If you stepped up and got the deluxe model for $680, it was $15,095.35 in the year 2023. Total Rockney production for the 1932 model year was 23,709 units. Before closing their doors mid-year of 33, the grand total was 37,879 units. Moving on to engine, only one engine on offer, 189.8 cubic inch displacement, flathead 6, 3.1 liters. It's good for 66 horsepower, 3,200 RPM, 136 pound-feet of torque at 1,200 RPM. With a bore of 3.125 inches and a stroke of 4.125 inches. So remember earlier in the video when Studebaker was approached by Vale and Cole. They wasn't really in the financial position to build a new car line, but took the gamble. Well, it didn't pay off. The Great Depression was still very much at play. Rockney sales were okay for a startup brand, but it cratered Studebaker, and it put them in receivership on March 18th of 1933. Eskine was pushed out as president in favor for someone that was more of a bean counter which led Eskine taking his own life. Just a sad story of a car that was released at the wrong time. Let's talk styling. Look at this grill. It almost looks like down here, 
it more or less resembles almost like a heart shape. And just look at how all of these lines protrude. Also, look at the negative space right here and how this is all designed. This looks like a heart in the grill shell. So it's important to note that there's only one horn, not dull. Bumpers, how those are designed. This one's got aftermarket turn signals. Headlights, they're huge. Here's my hand for reference. Look at the catwalk down in here. Side mounts. Look at how the side mounts are mounted. These almost look like shoes. Just look at this fender design, wire wheels. Rock knee hood ornament, center line. Look at all these lines. This car does have drip rails that runs the length of the car. Look at how these hinges are designed. Nice cabinet doors, running boards. Look how these rear fenders are designed. I absolutely love this piece back here, this gas tank and how it swoops back into the trunk section. I really love that line. They could have just did anything, but they chose to do it that way. Oh, we're back here. We might as well get in the trunk. Hey, look what's inside. Another trunk. I wonder if it keeps going. There's other parts and oil, paper towels, stuff that you need whenever you're on the road. The tail light situation. There's only one Studebaker tail light back here, but it looks like they put another tail light here. I'm not sure if this is a factory exhaust tip, but it looks like something that they would have maybe done. Also coming down this side, there's only one mirror which is attached to this side mount. See how it's strapped, almost with like a leather belt strap. Side mount over here as well. All right, getting inside. But before we do, look at how these door handles are designed. How thin this door frame is. Here's my fingers for reference. It's all nice and framed out. That is what the door panel looks like. There isn't an armrest. This is the door handle to get out. Window crank for the big window. It operates like this. Coming down inside the pedal box down here. High beam switch, clutch, brake, gas pedal, emergency brake and or handbrake. Take a look at this interior. Here's what over the hood looks like. Here's what first person over the hood looks like. Underneath the steering wheel, there is tons of room underneath the steering wheel to put my hand in between the steering wheel rim and my lap. And the only reason I show that is because if you're the same size as me, you'll fit in this car perfect. I wear size 36 pants, so if you're about the same size as me, you will fit in this car just like I do. On to the button switches and knobs. The first knob is to engage freewheeling. Press in to engage it. For those unfamiliar with freewheeling, this feature is a device in the transmission that disengages the drive shaft from the driven shaft. When the driven shaft rotates faster, than the drive shaft. Essentially what this does is it acts like it's in neutral, but everything is still being lubricated. With that said, when using freewheeling, just know that you don't have any engine braking. 
Hand throttle, amp meter, headlights, gasoline gauge, coolant temperature, speedometer. The two silver knobs flanking the speedometer are actually dash lights. Oil pressure, ignition, slash key, choke, heater control. Up above, there are sun visors, or sun visor one, and it comes down like this, reverse, kind of like reverse style. And it's a huge sun visor, like there's my hand for reference check out the rear view mirror situation not only is it a rear view mirror but the clock is also inside of it windshield wiper up there the windshield does crank out and then you just set it to where you want to set it. You can open it up as far as you want to until it reaches the stop. Down below is the heater and these vents control airflow. Coming to the rear door. So that is as far open as the rear door opens. Just notice how it's hinged. There's nice door mat pockets, door handle to get out, window crank for the big window. It operates like this. And it doesn't go all the way down, but it does go down most of the way. I have to show you this. So the owner was showing me this. This is what Studebaker gave you as basically almost like a receipt. This car cost $755 in 1932. The original owner put down $250 down. And then on the back, it says various stuff such as like, Studebaker features 40 miles per hour, even when new because of advanced engineering and precision workmanship. It is not necessary to poke along at 20 miles an hour in the breaking new Studebaker car. So that's pretty cool. Just take a gander at all of the space back here. This is what the front looks like from the back. Let's take a quick gander at the greenhouse or the pillar to glass ratio. This car is nice and airy. This is what visibility looks like out the rear. You can see that trunk back there. There's a nice privacy shade and or curtain for the rear window as well as this window. There's a nice grab handle to hold on to. Armrest, ashtray. This window does go down in the back. It's starting to get tight. So I guess that's about as far down as it goes. And just to show you, how far this one goes down. So you pretty much are even. That's that's pretty cool. There is a dome light here in the center. Robe rail. You could use this as a handle to hold on to. But this is more or less to put like a heavy blanket on. Because in the winter time up here. That is your only source of heat. So needless to say, he didn't really come back here that much. So this is to hold a heavy blanket to put on to stay warm. This is a footrest. You can put it up like that to not use it or put it down like that to use it to put your feet up like that. There is tons of knee space in this car. My knees nowhere near touching the seat profile. It is rather upright and it does dip down quite a bit back here, but there's so much space back here that it doesn't really matter. Everything that is found on the passenger side is also found on the driver's side. Armrest, I will say the armrest is in a weird position because it's angled at such a steep angle. The windows do go down, ashtray, door handle to hold on to, curtain, privacy shade. Getting underneath the hood, you just pull these up. They have some tension to them. And then just pull the hood straight up. So there it is. 
flathead six. See all the steering coming down. You can see the generator, starter, radiator. Coming to the other side, it's mostly the same thing, just on the other side. So this is the intake and exhaust side. Notice the carburetor down here, updraft. It says electric fuel pump on it. On the positive side, not often seen, and these are different. They look more upscale than they are, especially in the four-door flavor with the rear quarter windows being functional, tons of space in the rear, and this car is pretty well appointed with curtains, robe rail, ashtray, armrest, footrest, very well appointed car at this price point against it. Body parts, trim parts, people that know these are getting hard to find. It isn't a speed demon or a powerhouse performer. All right, now it's time for Would You Rather. Two scenarios today. In the first scenario, would you rather have a 1932 Ford Model B four-door sedan or 1932 Rockney four-door sedan or 1932 Hudson Terraplane four-door sedan? I'm gonna leave this here for a minute. If you need more time, feel free, pause the video. Okay, moving on to the second scenario. I totally forgot to include the Would You Rather in last episode. So here it goes. 1956 Lincoln Premier or 1956 Mercury Montclair or 1956 Packard Clipper. Going to leave this here for a minute. If you need more time, feel free to pause the video. Now it's time for Name That Tune. First person to get both the name of the band and song title correctly in the comment section will have their comment pinned to the top of it. Thank you all so much for coming out and watching this. If you'd like to get in touch with me, shoot me a comment in the comment section below or check out our Facebook group that correlates with this YouTube channel. If you don't have Facebook and would like to reach me, send me an email. All of that will be linked in the description below. Just know I appreciate all of the support. And until next time, toodaloo!